good. So I'm going to call to uh, order the uh, meeting for the Rally Planning Board for Tuesday, July 12, 2017. Uh, the first item on the agenda tonight is a uh, is an open house meeting for uh, with the Merrimack Valley Planning Commission uh, to, to discuss the housing needs. Uh, you, you're putting together a little workshop this morning, uh, this afternoon, to uh, to brief presentation, uh, and then we have some citizen input. So. Uh, Kirk, would you mind? Just uh, this is Angela Vincent uh, with MBPC. Uh, Mr. Burkett, Mike Burkett. Thanks, with MBPC. two of you. Appreciate you coming out tonight. Yeah. So, take, we can the floor is yours. You want? Okay. Yeah. I'm, as I said, uh, I'm Mike Burkett. I'm the corporate planning manager for the commission. Angela Vincent is the economic development planner and also the uh, the project manager extraordinaire on this housing plan that we are uh, we are putting together for the region. Um, I will just give a few uh, slides, brief introduction, and I'm going to turn it over to Angie for the meat potatoes of the plan. Uh, who's MVPC? If you don't know us, the Merrimack Valley Planning Commission was established in 1959, so we've been around for a while. Uh, we're comprised of 15 communities. Uh, they run along the Merrimack River from the Lawrence Andover area up the river to Newburyport and uh, Raleigh and, 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 and Salisbury and all the towns in between that, uh, that, that border the river. Uh, we get funding mainly from uh, federal, state, and uh, federal and state grants and there is a small local assessment that we get funds from, uh, but most of our funds is from federal uh, and, and, and state grants. Uh, we are governed by a board of commissioners. The commissioner from Raleigh is, is Bob Snow, uh, which I'm sure you all know. Um, there's 15 staff that we have. Uh, our largest department is the transportation department. Some of you may have worked with Tony Kamarnik over the years. Uh, his, his group has, uh, has, has five people in it. Then this community economic development group, with, which is Angie and I. Uh, we have an environmental department uh, with, two, with, with two people, and we have a GIS staff uh, with three people in it. So we have the expertise in those, those areas that I just mentioned. And we, we're there to assist assist communities, the, the 15 communities uh, in our region. Here's a map of the region, uh, just to show you, as I said, from Andover, Methuen, and Lawrence up the river to uh, Salisbury and Newbury Port. Uh, what we're doing, the project goal, is to develop the first regional housing plan for the Merrimack Valley to identify strategies for developing housing in the region, developing all types of housing, housing for the elderly. Uh, uh, affordable housing, market rate housing, uh, apartments, small homes, what, whatever the needs are in the, in the individual communities, that's what the plan will, will, will talk about. Uh, where we're getting the funds to do this, uh, we're getting 150000 from uh, what's called a community compact cabinet. Um, it's a new initiative from Governor Baker. It started about a year and a half ago or so. Um, it was first just for individual communities to apply for funds to put forth so-called best practices. Um, and then they opened it up to regional planning agencies and regional school districts for, for funds. We applied for a grant to, to do the, the regional housing plan. We're also using some funds from DLTA, which is the District Local Technical Assistance Funds, which we have received for the past nine years. Uh, it was a fairly new program started by the previous governor, uh, which is still in existence. Uh, it, it provides uh, funds for us to do planning work uh, for our, our municipalities. And the funds we applied through the Community Compact, they weren't able to give us what we applied for, but they partnered with Mass Housing to give us the balance of the funds that we needed to undertake the project. Um, we and have anticipated from the start this would be a 12-month project. Um, it may go into the next year um, for the boards in the individual communities to approve the plan itself. And if it does run into the spring, that's, that's, that's not a problem. Uh, but it, but it, may, it, it may certainly do that because uh, it's a very ambitious project for 12 months. For 12 months. Uh, Multi-stakeholder process, public sector, private sector um, um, are, are involved. Um, is, and, and the good thing is there's no cost to the communities. If you want to undertake a housing production plan on your own, it would probably cost anywhere from 15000 to 25000 
Um, so uh, for no cost to you, you will receive a housing production plan. Um, and as I said, the outcome local housing production plans and a regional housing strategy for the region. Uh, and what exactly is a housing production plan? I, I believe Rowley has one. Yeah, they have one. I don't know how old it is. Uh, they're only good for, for, for five years, but I think you do have one. Um, we do, we do have one. A, a master plan or is it something other than that? No, it's, it's different. Uh, housing, it's a housing production plan, it's okay. called. Uh, you submit it to, it has to be approved by the planning board, it has to be submitted by, approved by the board of selectmen, okay. then it goes to DHCD and they and they approve it. Okay. Uh, that's, that's a process. So but you've established... Uh, these are the guidelines. It was more than five years ago, I can't remember. Okay, it's, it, it very well may be. But even if it's seven or eight years old, you would have identified goals in that housing production plan, which you may think are, and, and believe are still valid today. Uh, they, they very well may be because uh, there's possibility the goals you set forth then you weren't able to achieve, uh, or you achieved some but not all of them. So those goals that you have uh, may still be uh, valid today. That's one of the first steps you should do is look at your existing plan, look at the goals, look at the strategies that are there, and tell us if, if, if they're still valid. Uh, and then we will work with you on, on identifying new goals and strategies as we go forward as well. Um, so it's a five-year strategy to develop affordable housing. It identifies community needs, goals, and strategies, as I said, and it includes a plan for developing that 10% affordable housing stock, uh, which is listed on the subsidized housing inventory uh, through through DHCD. Uh, as you probably know, 40B projects. There's a 20-25% component of 40B projects. Uh, they're affordable. Those units go on the so-called subsidized housing inventory. Uh, if it's an apartment complex, that's your 40B project. Uh, even though only 20% of those units might be affordable, the entire number of units goes on the subsidized housing inventory. So that's kind of how it works. Uh, and in creating the plan, I'm going to turn over the next couple of sections to Angie, and she will get into the details on creating the plan and some data that we've uncovered for Alan. Great. Do you, is it okay if I sit? Please do, yeah. Thanks. Sorry, I, there are notes in some of my sure. I'm going to be referring to later, but and I, I normally stand, but it's going to be hard for me to see, <laughs> and for some of you to see as well. So again, Angela Vincent, I'm the Economic Development Planner and Project Manager for this plan. And I'm going to go through a little bit about how we're creating this plan, because it is really unique. As Mike mentioned, this is the first of its kind, not just for the region, but also on a statewide basis. We were given funding to, normally uh, funding comes to a region to do a regional plan, but not every individual chapter will serve as an individual ch uh, plan, a housing production plan like this does. Um, it, so we actually had to get quote unquote approval from the Department of Housing and Community Development to take this approach. So there's a lot of eyes on us right now, which is a little bit of pressure, but it is a lot of fun as we go through this. So we've created a three-prong approach to guide our process. We felt that there were a lot of important pieces, but they're, the three main buckets are guiding our staff. We actually have a, four, a team of four, a GIS, our GIS manager, Mike and myself, and our executive director are guiding this process internally. This is an all hands on deck project for us as well. Um, so we actually have a lot of other staff that are helping us with our regional events and um, as we go forward, hopefully, hopefully with um, some of the strategies as well. So our first big bucket is public engagement. And as you saw in that last slide, it goes through the entire project. We believe that public engagement is going to be key. In addition to working with planning boards and boards of selectmen, which is important because you're going to be the final say on whether the, the housing production plan piece of this plan is, is actually approved, um, we're hoping to create buy-in and make sure that these plans are accurate, that they're relevant, and that they actually do express the needs that the community has for housing in the future. Um, this plan is a five-year plan, so it'll go through 2023, um, but we're hoping that, that the community members will also think of this as a longer-term plan. Um, we have a project website that we created specifically for this project. It's actually housed under mvpc.org, but it's a brand new approach that we're taking to our, our, our uh, projects, if you will. Um, everything about how we got to, into this project, our funding sources, how to get involved. Um, we actually have a variety of different ways to get involved that I'll go over. 
Um, who to contact? You know, there's a lot of folks, as I mentioned, there's four of us um, that are involved in this project, so we want to be as accessible to you as possible throughout the project if you have questions. Um, we have a lot of related information. Housing is a complex issue. Um, it rides, you know, there's issues with transportation, there are issues with disabilities, there are issues with a growing and older, uh, older population. Um, so we're trying to gather as much information so you can be educated um, and, and try to kind of stay up to speed on kind of the changing environment of housing uh, for the future. And then there's a lot of data. So we're going to go through some data tonight. Um, we're going to be very quick with it. Um, and hopefully it'll be fun and painless. Um, but that is going to guide a lot of our, help, our helping you to express needs and, and to give us um, what you think uh, we need to do for the future. We are one the bigger way, um, the biggest way I should say that we're engaging people are through regional open house events. Our first one was on May 24th. And as you can see in this picture, we actually had a very diverse crowd. Um, we had a, a couple folks in wheelchairs. We had a dog um, who was helping with someone who had PTSD. Um, and we had people from Newburyport all the way down to Lawrence. Um, it was a standing room only event, uh, which we were really excited that we packed the room at the Northern Essex Community College in Haver excuse me, in uh, Lawrence. There's one in Haverhill as well. Um, and we had a lot of activities. We want to make sure that these are fun when people go there. It's not just a presentation that we're actually engaging them in conversation. Um, and so we had a, a wall where people could tell us what housing in the Merrimack Valley needs to be. And then we also had what you're seeing right here, where we're actually taking this to every community and asking people to tell us what type of housing that they prefer. All of this housing is in the Merrimack Valley. There are photos of, of actual, actual housing in the Merrimack Valley, except for the tiny house, um, which we're hoping to replicate sometime in the future in the Merrimack Valley, but not quite yet. Um, so we're asking you know, tonight that when we're, when we're, when we're done, that you, you vote on this and tell us um, what your preference is. As you can see, this was from our regional event, so there are a lot more dots on there. Um, but we're taking photos of each of these every time we go to an event. So we took one Monday at Amesbury, and two weeks ago we had three night meetings in a row. Um, so this is our second way of engaging people, is coming to these community workshops. Some of them have been an hour, like we're doing today, or 45 minutes. Sorry, Chris. <laughs> we're going to keep it to 45, I promise. Um, and some of them have been an hour and a half to two hours. So it's really going to be dependent, but they are important. This is where we're really going to understand the community needs is by talking to you. You don't have to limit yourself to one guy. That's right. We have lots of dots up there, so feel free. Um, our other way that we recognize and have heard, um, and I've been doing public engagement my whole career, my whole 17 years as a planner, uh, and there are 50 percent of the American population will not attend a public meeting, unfortunately. So you should pat your bat yourself on the back for being here today because you are you are part of that half of the population. But how do we engage the rest of them? So uh, we actually engaged the Co-Urbanize, which is a Massachusetts-based company. They're based in Boston. Um, to do an online platform that engages a two-way conversation around housing. And what this does, and there's a card up here if you haven't gotten one yet um, to do this, and actually there's a sign, if you've seen the sign out here that says text to tell us what type of housing we need in Rally, that's this, this tool. Um, the idea is it's two-pronged. One is a mapping tool where you can actually tell us what types of housing and categories of housing that you would like and where you would like to see it, and obviously you'd, you'd, you'd choose Rally, hopefully. Um, and then also there's, there are general questions that you can respond to, too. You can like people's posts or support them, it's called, um, and you can also comment on people's posts. So the idea is it's kind of like Facebook, except for a little more interactive. Um, we've got, a, we actually have a really good amount, and thanks to you, you for posting that, because we actually are getting a really good participation from Rally, so I'm really excited about that. And, we're hoping to continue the conversation um, throughout the rest of this project. So this will be active until December. You can say anything you want to say as long as it's polite. Because yes. Because it'll screen out any bad language. Yes. But, but <laughs> you don't have to agree with any, any what anyone else says or what we say or anything. You can say what you want, but yeah, it would be it would be great if, 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 if we got as many people to participate as, as possible. Great. So we're, our second bucket is to investigate and respect existing planning efforts. Mike mentioned your housing production plan, uh, which I thought you had a, pro a, pop, a um, copy of in there, but we that will be referenced as we go forward. We didn't do so for tonight necessarily because we're really talking about needs and having that kind of more basic conversation. Um, and that data is a little older, so we're collecting new data and seeing what those needs say based on the data. Um, but ultimately, goals and, and strategies can stay the same, especially if you haven't accomplished them yet, or if they're relatively recent, or if they are a long-term goal for the, the town. So respecting those and making sure we're bringing them forward if they're still accurate. So we'll have that discussion at our second workshop in um, October. 
And then also with your local planning efforts, so uh, master plan, um, Kirk mentioned that you have a, a comprehensive plan, so we'll need to take a look at that as well. Um, and, and any other studies that might be going on right now as it relates to housing, which as I mentioned is a very diverse and complex subject. So housing has <laughs> tech actually has a lot to do with a lot of things. So. And then finally, we'll be coordinating with the state agencies. Mike mentioned the Department of Housing and Community Development, but also um, MassDOT, Mass Department of Transportation, and any others that might have something that we would need to relate to um, and reference in this plan. And then finally, information gathering. So everything's gonna be based on some information, um, whether it's census information or information from the state, from the Department of Housing and Community Development. Uh, we're also gonna be conducting focus groups, so uh, targeted focus groups around uh, any stakeholders that may not be coming to these meetings. We've been identifying uh, councils on aging have been coming, which is great, so thank you. Um, but we're also, what, what about the, the folks who live in affordable housing? Have, are they coming to these events? Um, uh, disability folks, um, contractors and developers, we, we are inviting those people, people to attend, but whether they choose to or not, um, especially if it's on weeknights, then they might not be able to. So making sure those voices are heard is really important to us. Um, polling the quote and co-urbanize that that tool actually has a really cool background feature where we can run reports on the themes that we're seeing in uh, from the data and from the information that people are, are posting so we're going to be using that to inform our decisions and, and bring that back to you as well in October to discuss and then um, we geek out whenever we go to communities and do windshield surveys and take pictures of houses and people think we're crazy but <laughs> we this is how we, we do our work best and you know as planners and I'm sure Kirk would agree you know we're very visual people and so this is how we make informed decision and decisions and show people what to do and what not to do potentially by pictures so with that we're going to move into the data as I mentioned we use a lot of census data and American community <coughs> survey data the most recent uh, data set we're using is a five what we call five-year data set so it's data that's been collected over five-year time period from 2011 to 2015 and that was released in December, so it's, it's, it's fresh information. Um, Mass Department of Transportation helps us with um, population projections, so we'll see some of that tonight as well. Uh, DHCD provides the subsidized housing inventory, and then we have a smattering of a couple other things that we'll show you tonight too, but we did wanna show our data sources. And before I move on, I know I am talking fast. Um, we are going to be posting this presentation in addition to the video on the website. We'll be posting the final presentation, including our discussion tonight on the project website that I showed you. So we'll start with who's living in Raleigh, and we're gonna have three buckets tonight. Who's living in Raleigh, where are they living, and then the cost associated, or what they're making right now in order to be able to live in Raleigh. Um, so this is a, you have a pretty diverse pie chart here. Yeah. Um, 45 years is the, um, the average age, which is pretty similar to the region. The region's around 43 years of age. Um, but nearly half of your population is, is over 45. Um, so those are things to, to take into consideration as, as we begin planning or continue planning for housing. Um, it's a relatively small number of 60-year-olds, but um, what we're seeing is that in, by 2035, um, that you're, you're actually starting to decline in population, but when we looked at the background numbers that MassDOT is giving us, by 2035, your over 65 population will be 33% of the community. So a third of your community will actually be over 65 years old. Um, so those things are really important to remember as you move forward. Um, you know, there's a possibility that the 25, that, that your <coughs> declining population is due to this group of folks that may not come back. Um, these are folks that maybe they're coming back to live with parents for a little while, but they can't afford necessarily to live on their own in Raleigh yet, and actually in the Merrimack Valley in general, so I'm not gonna pick on, on Raleigh. <laughs> um, but that is important to remember, is how do we, how do we create housing that, and lifestyles that people can afford back in their hometown? Oops, sorry. So this isn't surprising, and actually we're seeing declining populations in other communities too, so don't worry, <laughs> it's not necessarily a bad thing, but, um, and we will receive new population projections next year, but we're anticipating that the trend's probably gonna remain the same. So moving on to household types, um, the not surprising that the most common household type in Raleigh is the married couple, and the, one of the larger ones that we've seen in the region. Um, they're usually a little under, like around 50%. Um, so almost 70% of your population or of your households are, are married with a large majority of them and again this is one of the bigger ones that we've seen in the region are empty nesters so people living to, to a couple living at home with, um, no children under 18 in the house 
But uh, also surprising, and, and I think I talked to Kirk a little bit about this before, it was uh, Rally's numbers were a little different than some of the other communities. We were actually, it was fun to watch the, these, come, these come together. But your third largest household type are people living alone, but the majority of them are over 65 already. So again, something to keep in mind is we get, this is not necessarily going to change, it's actually going to grow, and, and so will this, this number of total households that's living alone. So single families or smaller homes, starter homes, apart, more apartments, um, things like that to keep in mind. That equals 244 households, um, or about 11% of the population, of the households in, in, the, region, is in, the, in Rally. So I mentioned a couple times, and I think Mike did too, on um, uh, disabled residents, and this was brought to our attention at, by the Commission on Disability in Andover. So we started to include this information because it is important. Um, especially with an aging population, but not, even without that, that, we do have folks who have both cognitive and um, physical um, disabilities in our region um, and in our communities. And so in Raleigh, uh, and these are self-reporting numbers, so keep that in mind um, as anything with the census. You know, you can't make someone fill out the census, unfortunately. <laughs> um, but so self-reporting numbers were at about, uh, Raleigh's about 9.9% in 2014. We couldn't get 2015 data that was fine-grained enough, so we looked, uh, we, we will be looking for it. Um, but this is important, you know, for, for housing as we go, as we, uh, as we progress, and I think every, most people got the handout about how to create new housing that does accommodate the basic um, types of, of disabilities. Um, and again, that's not just a physical disability. Cognitive is, and mental are really important too in how we design our homes. And I wanted to mention, you know, there'll be a couple others of these. The percentage is gonna be on the right column, and the, uh, the number of, of people will be on the left. There's not that many of these, but there's a lot of information we need to present, so sometimes it's better <laughs> with a more complicated chart. So household size, um, this was uh, about average for the region, um, two and four are usually about the average two, two and four person households, but the fact that they're both shrinking was, was interesting to us, and that three is growing significantly. Um, I have a thought on the three person, and that's that the school children are coming back and living with their parents. Right now, we don't have a way to capture that in census data because it's a relatively new phenomenon. But I think that as we go, as we, uh, some of the planners start to talk about that phenomenon, maybe we'll be seeing that and, and start to be able to parse that out a little bit more um, through the numbers. Um, but that's that's kind of my guess right now. But if, if anyone had any thoughts on that, it was it was interesting to see the, the major, the pretty big decline, especially in two, and then the major increase in three person. So the unit types, uh, overwhelmingly, and again, this was a, a different, a little bit more so than the rest of our region, but 76% of your homes uh, are, are owner, excuse me, are um, single family, detached. Um, the average for the region for owner occupied versus renter is about 70 to 30. Um, so um, renters usually are, are the ones that, uh, uh, that they're, they're those, once you're usually in the more low, lower income or more affordable homes, at least that we're seeing, or more affordable units, I should say. Um, but used to, the three to 19 was actually a big category as well. And we'll be looking at assessing data that will help us make this more fine green, but for now this is what the census is telling us. And then we mentioned the subsidized housing inventory. This is for the entire region right now. The pink or red, whatever that color is that you're, you're probably seeing, is 10% is or more. Um, so we, we want to achieve 10%. That's the goal that the state has asked us to, to help um, communities to achieve, is 10% affordable housing or more. Um, and so we're seeing smatterings of that throughout the region. As a, as a whole, we actually are over 10% in, in the Merrimack Valley, um, with a couple um, stragglers here and there. But the goal is to try to help you with that uh, through this plan and to uh, lay out a five-year plan for you to increase that number. Um, so for Rally right now, the, uh, we need about 128 more to get to 10%. You're at about 4.2 with 94 units. Uh, the majority of them are rental uh, with no elderly or family. So that might be a, 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 way, a, a place to focus on the affordable units. And then getting to what they're making. So uh, Rally, the median income is $86,820. Um, it was actually the largest increase in median income in our region, uh, 15, almost 16% increase since 2010, um, which is higher than, the, than Massachusetts and, and the US. Um, 
us, actually, and obviously higher than us. We, the, you, the region as a whole took a little bit of a dip, unfortunately, but uh, hopefully that, that will come back in the next, uh, the next time we check this out. And then as far as living in poverty, this is a, according to the federal definition, which we'll go into in a, in a second, um, but about 5% of the, the population, or 302 residents, are living in, in poverty um, in Raleigh. So the largest percent are actually in your 35 to 64 year category, which we're gonna, as part of our next step, is try to parse that out a little bit more. That's a very big age category. <laughs> I mean, I'm in that category, and I don't consider myself ready to be 65. So, um, so we're gonna try to parse that out a little bit more. But again, that is important as we know that some of that population, we already see the projections that MassDOT's giving us that you know 33 percent of your population will be over 65 in 2035. So we. We can guess that many of them are probably in that, that bigger realm and that we need to consider that, that they're not making a lot, so they need to they need a housing that's affordable. This is the federal poverty guideline. So for a two-person household, which is your most one of your most common households in Raleigh right now, um, 16,240 is the threshold um, for, to be considered in living in poverty. And this is what the households look like. So about 10% of your households right now are living in poverty. That's what that looks like. However, that doesn't mean that they are not, they don't fall into HUD's category for low, very low, and extremely low income. Um, right now, the median income um, for, excuse me, 80% of the median income that you would need to make in order to qualify for a subsidized housing inventory unit would be 60, excuse me, uh, 54,400. So when you do the numbers for that, this is the, actually the population that would be eligible for a subsidized housing inventory unit in Raleigh. 32.5% of your population, or 715 households. So again, it's important to remember um, as we move forward, it does, those numbers aren't always run, and we don't always see that <laughs> um, and t until they start to, and some of them may not even qualify because they have other assets or things that are, are keeping them out of being able to qualify for those units. And keep in mind that the, the poverty statistics also will include a couple in their 70s um, who aren't employed anymore they're on a fixed income but they could be living in um, eight hundred thousand dollar home um, where they don't have a mortgage so it will also include those people too sure. the affordable housing stocks though are set aside for moderate income for the most part not necessarily at poverty level so what's the moderate income threshold for uh, for most of these subsidies, for, for the affordable housing subsidies that are available for some of the This is for the region. It's you'd have to make fifty-four thousand or less in order to be in order to live in it. To, in to a, in oh, a okay, okay, I'm sorry. That, so that's already that, that's that the threshold. Gotcha. Yeah. Sorry. No, no, no. <laughs> There's so many different ways to say yeah, it. Right. But yeah, yeah, that's that's for the region, and unfortunately, you know, we have a very very big range in median incomes in this right. region and so, so qualifying for some folks like in Lawrence that's a really hard thing to qualify for because more people are way under that. But do you do it on a regional or a community basis? It's on a regional scale yeah, so, okay. unfortunately that's how HUD runs the numbers. So even though your median income is is what it is, it's still they still use a regional income for, number for the income. Uh, for the Sorry, for the 80% number. <laughs> so the last slide that we have here is, uh, and I, I started doing these for many of our communities to see what people are paying for housing and transportation costs. Because um, this is another indicator for how burdened people are based on their basic needs. And right now in Raleigh, um, over 50% of the population, according to, the, according to the Center for Neighborhood Technology, which I mentioned earlier was a source of income, um, over 50% of the residents uh, or households are actually paying more than 60% of their income on housing and transportation costs combined, which does mean that, <coughs> that the, the community is housing burdened overall. Um, many of them are not working in rallies, so that's not really a surprise, although maybe some of them are taking public transportation, I hope, um, <laughs> from the commuter rail. Um, but, you know, with services not really being accessible as accessible here, um, and rising housing costs, this isn't really a surprise. This is pretty average for the region. I think we're, we're closer to more, uh, we're, we're around 50% for the region, so. <clears throat> so I'll summarize this and then we'll go into conversation because we have about 15 minutes and, and we do want to save the, the rest of this time for the actual needs piece, but uh, two and four person households are shrinking, as we saw, um, with the three person households are growing significantly. Your poverty is focused on the age category of 35 to 64 year olds. 
about almost 10% of the re residents, again, self-reporting are um, have disabilities in the community, and that's all types of disabilities. 32.5% uh, of your households are making under the 80% of the median income right now, so they, again, qualify for uh, subsidized housing. And then over half of the households, as we just saw, are paying more than 60% of their income on the housing and transportation costs. So with that, I'm going to switch gears here because I'm going to take notes in the actual... No one's still seeing that. So I'd love to hear from you all. What, it, what are you thinking? What do you think of what the data said? Um, is it surprising to you? Are there other needs that, that besides that last slide, um, that, or that we discussed a little bit around elderly housing, or it sort of bears things out? I mean, I think people do see Raleigh as having a slightly uh, older population in some of the other areas. I think so. It wasn't surprising to see that that. Uh, Concentration of older citizens. Yep. Um, you know, uh, I think that the school children. Uh, I'm not sure how accurate that data is. There, it does seem like there's a, uh, there was a couple of a couple of years there was a pretty good boom of, of, of children. So I, I think that the, I mean I know that there's some uh, some of that data doesn't pick up the, the those years when we had. Uh, families moving to town at a higher rate, so I think that, the, but I don't know, you know, I'm just reacting to what I see in here, you know. So you're, you're thinking that there should be a higher number, a percentage of 0 to 19 year olds? I think, I mean, I don't know, it's, it's all in the data, but what do you got, what's that data? Yeah, Dave Peterson uh, from the Board of Selectmen and the Resident, obviously, uh, was in dealing with the schools, uh, we have the school committee first here, as a matter of fact, but the trend in the three communities that comprise Triton has been a lowering of the number of students for a number of years now, yeah. and that's expected to continue. So using that data and looking at your charts, I'm assuming that means that there's going to be more two-person households. The other thing I want to just throw into is uh, when I was first a selectman in 1990, the first time I ran, I've been on and off for a number of years, Raleigh joined the consortium in Peabody for the affordable housing. I don't remember what it was exactly called. We got pretty heavily involved. I know I myself, we, we were involved in looking for, for some affordable housing and some people who could afford the affordable housing. The whole project lasted about two years because basically we ended up not finding any available housing for sale and not enough people who could afford what was available. So it really it just it couldn't seem to get the two to meet, and the project kind of fell apart. So our, the money we get for that, I think, goes to the Ipswich. Oh, okay. The Home Consortium? Yeah, it's, yep. it's, it goes mm -hmm. to Ipswich. So there's a real need. I don't, and, you know, we could, in looking at it, was, we were, were all amateurs. So uh, it was, Peabody was great to work with, but we just, the community like this, the single family housing was just so expensive. And just real quickly, so I don't dominate here, is, you know, my wife and I are, over 70, we'd love to downsize and stay in Raleigh, but there is no ability in Raleigh to downsize and, and stay in Raleigh. You know, if we want to sell a house and get something smaller, whether it be an apartment or an affordable condo that we could afford by selling a house, yeah. we have to go elsewhere. So we're, we're very, we're very frustrated. Region, throughout the region, we're hearing the same thing because, as you saw with the, with the data, it's not just Raleigh, but throughout the Merrimack Valley, it's, it's an older population. Um, the whole state of Massachusetts, most of New England, it's, it's the same way. It's an older population, although baby boomers are, are, are getting older. That's a huge generation of people. Um, and uh, yeah, they having a, they would like to downsize. They, but they, it, it doesn't mean they want to move to Florida or Arizona or someplace else. They want to stay local, but there's not a lot of options. And that's what we're finding. Well, what Dave is saying is what leads into what I'm seeing in the numbers of smaller units and maybe a little density that would cover maybe some of the elderly people that live in town that want to downsize, and maybe some of the people who are um, in their 20s and 30s that would need a place to stay that they can afford. I mean, everything is dependent upon square footage as far as cost goes. The bigger the house, the more it costs. Well, it's interesting, a few years back, I'm going to say four or five years ago, I'm reading the Lawrence Eagle Tribune I believe it was 
hand over or not hand over. There was a, a movement on, I don't know how it ever went, to address the issue of, of starting to encourage developers to build smaller houses on smaller lots to keep people, as in my situation as I'm saying. Now, whether that ever went anywhere, or, you know, I don't get the Tribune, so I don't know whatever happened to it, but it was, it was a very interesting concept. And it was something that obviously I was looking at, my kids are up and out so on and so forth, but, you know, and, and they had to do it through zoning and, you know, planning board issues, because in that town there was no, you know, the lot sizes had to be a certain, you know, big, big lots and so on and so forth, so there, there was no way to encourage builders to build some smaller houses to it, because I'm sure, I'm sure if they could do it, the market has got to be good for smaller housing units, yeah. but on the other hand, if to make a profit, they were going to sell the big lots and there's something along that line. I don't know how to address it, but I think that would be Andover. Just if you could check with Andover, maybe see if they ever did anything. I think it was Andover. Either the Andover or not the Andover. Did they ever come to fruition or what did they do? You know? yeah. I think it's being done sporadically throughout the region, but yeah, there's not. It's uh, if you want to <coughs> down zone, so to speak, uh, from acre lots or half acre lots down to 10,000, 15,000 square foot lots, it still is met with a lot of opposition. In a lot of communities, and that's 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 the hard part. Yeah, and the other scary thing when you look at those numbers and do a little analyzation is the fact that our school costs are skyrocketing, and yet our population is overwhelmingly 65 and above, mostly heading for fixed incomes. So right. As, as the school part, as the school bills grow and the school costs grow, the the population that we have here in town doesn't have the income ability to keep up with. You know, all these things become intertwined. It's, it's a real, I'm glad the, to see that we're looking. To get the empty nesters are going to be leaving at some point. I mean, you know, I, I myself am thinking of downsizing moving out right. of town. And I think a lot of my contemporaries are. Yeah, there's a lot of us. We we're all in the same boat. boat. No, I agree. We're, we're all, all in the same Some boat. of us sitting here. Uh, so at a certain point, people are going to be leaving, and who's going to be moving into their big houses? And I think it's going to be families. I, mean, I don't think it's going to be, uh, you know, married 20 year olds and no kids. So, a lot of young, I young, think, young I think families, there seems to be an assumption in the data that the, the older population is going to stay here. I don't think that's going to happen. Yeah, so hopefully that the new population numbers next year will say something. I don't know well, the, maybe in five years. I don't know if the new population can afford a mortgage. That's yeah. the problem. Yeah, yeah, well, that's right. The problem is, too, is if you want to stay in the area, you look around at all the over 55 condo developments. It costs more to move into one of those than it does to yeah. my house. Yeah. And they're big. They're not they're small. Big. They're, 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 they're <laughs> no square footage in my house. So. You can say developers should build smaller buildings, but they, they, they don't want to do that. that. And the other thing is, they'll throw in, they don't want to build apartments in, in Raleigh for some reason. And I've talked with a couple of them to try to encourage them uh, to do that because, as you were saying, you get full credit for the units if it's done under 40 feet. But there doesn't seem to be any interest on the part of developers to build apartments. They said why? I'm just curious. Uh, uh, I think the title, uh, the fact we don't have sewers or something to do that's what we're But Dave, you don't have to mow your lawn. We don't want a 50 <laughs> I did that tonight before I came. <laughs> <laughs> but no, it's a real, I, I think we, you're, we're identifying some real issues that, yeah. 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 that you're, I mean, you, you've presented to us. How we deal with them is a whole different issue. Right? Right. And that's, we, that's October. Yeah. <laughs> I think Just most towns have problems with 40B because we have so little control over 40B. And the developers know that we have so little control over it that they don't propose good stuff. They come in and want to flip this thing and make a good buck. And most of these 40B projects are terrible. Well, a good, a good example is that. Recently, in the last year, there's a uh, affordable housing on one of the uh, one of the condo units up on Naval Street, up near Boxford Road. It's about 12. I'm going to say 12 or 15. I'm not sure of the number. But when the person who had an affordable one of the affordable units wanted to move out, they were unable to find a buyer who qualified, and they had to get permission from I think the selectman gave it, maybe the plan, but I don't remember who it was. Had to get permission to to rent the unit out because they couldn't find a buyer. So, I mean, there's some real issues out there on you know, these, these kinds of income and available housing is, is, I don't know how we can match these things up because it's a real difficult problem. 
I just recently read an article on some affordable housing. They, they want to build a Peabody, and they were talking about the rents that it will garner, and for the affordable units, for an efficiency apartment, not even a one bedroom, an efficiency, it was $1,200 a month. That was Ridiculous. the affordable unit. And, but it doesn't match up with the median income, the 80% of the median income and such. I don't know, it's, it's just, it's not working right. Well, I think that's why people are paying 60% or more. Yeah. I mean, yeah, and, right. and if you're going to take the train right. to Boston, I mean, that, that, it's, it's not a cheap thing to drive yeah. the rails, man. Or, or take really a bus or whatever. So yeah, it's, it's a real, uh, it's real issue. And I, I think um, Joan Peterson is on the half, but also I was the director for 20 years at the uh, Housing Authority. And HUD, I think it's every two years, changes those numbers. And because of where we are, we're not, we're not part of the Lawrence and the Haverhill numbers, we're the Boston numbers right. uh, because of Rowley. If they, ha if they have changed it in two years, I apologize. But they change those numbers every two years and you look at them and it's just not addressing the right people. That, when you ask that question and you, and you look at it, two people had fought $55,000, you know, that's a it, it, it's just not addressing the right thing. There is more needs for affordable, you know, elderly housing, family housing, uh, downsized type housing. I mean, we have looked, we've looked at different towns, and I've come out of there and I said to them, that's almost more square footage than I have in my house. I don't want that. I want to stay in Raleigh. But at our next, I, I think it's the next open house we have, we're gonna have that developer come in. Mm -hmm who has built um, small homes on very small lots. He's, he's done it in Concord, uh, but he has, he uh, supposedly has some great stories to tell, the good, the bad, the ugly, so to speak, on how, 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 how he's done what he's done in the towns he has and how he hasn't been allowed to do it in the towns where he hasn't been allowed to do it, and it should be an interesting presentation because these are, these are uh, the ones he didn't conquer um, aren't affordable units, but it is a uh, it is a style of home where elderly people can sell their big home and move into these. Uh, they're, close, they're compact, they're close together in Concord. It's in the West Concord Village area, so it's within walking distance of West Concord uh, uh, shops and retail stores and, 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 and the train stations right there. So he's got to come and talk about that experience. Well, that's the thing is, if you got a five hundred thousand dollar home that you're selling in Raleigh. Find something for two hundred thousand. Right, right. I, it would, would be a good swap. I'm sure that's not worth my while to, to pay five hundred thousand to move into a condo somewhere else. You know what I mean, you're looking to take a look. A lot of us, your nest egg that you've accumulated is, is involved in the equity of the house, and you lose all of that to move into something of equal value. I mean, some people can afford that. But a lot of people are ordinary, ordinary working people. But that's part of their their retirement income is the equity in the house. And he mentioned the one in Concord of all the different things that you're nearby. We don't have that in Raleigh. I mean, when the train came, it was like, oh my God, we're moving. And that's it. We have no buses. We have, you got to call a taxi from Newburyport. So it's not available, like you says, that Concord one sounds great. But where would you put it in Raleigh? Because we don't have those other services that you can walk to and do things. Small lots, septic systems. Yeah, no, yes. it's, it's yeah. soil tiles. Right. Yeah. 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 And that's something that we're looking into. There, um, a couple of communities around here are looking at package treatment plants, which is an alternative source for more dense areas to um, to be able to, to build up um, or, or be denser on a lot. Uh, the Cape just finished a plan because they were required to because of <laughs> uh, National Clean Water Act um, uh, rule, rules and regulations. But they've come up with some really ingenious ways, and Europe's been doing this for a while. So I think we're actually going to have some good lessons learned um, and some green infrastructure types of, of techniques that we can be implementing. That because we're really close, to our, our soils aren't exactly the same as the Cape, but there are some similarities in the perk and the issues related to um, being able to to um, have septic. Uh, given that what Cliff said that uh, large developers would put uh, you know, a high density apartment buildings in there, that would be something that might create some opportunities yeah. for a developer to come in. So that's something that would be interesting to see. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, we're actually um, the planners. So Kirk, hopefully you can come in September. We're going to have a lunch and learn for the planners to talk about the types of um, new treatment plants that are going on around, uh, mm -hmm. just to be able to address these very issues. If there were some sub subsidies for those, that would really help. Yep, I agree. I'm Marissa Wallen. I, um, I sit on the school committee, but I'm here just as a resident tonight. Um, I started to get interested in this because I sit on the Pine Grove School <coughs> Foundation Committee, and this was something that we heard over and over and over again when we were going to the ballot box last May. Um, we talked about this when we were in the meetings, that you kind of have your, your communities within Raleigh, and you're kind of very familiar with their perspectives on things. But when I sat on that board, I had people just randomly coming up to me in market basket and saying, you know, you sit on this board, I want to tell you. And one thing that I did hear over and over again was that there, there are a lot of people that are in Joan and Dave's situation where they, they are in this house, it's in some cases too big. One of the women said to me, I don't want to clean all these rooms, but I, I can't get out. Um, <laughs> you know? Um, and they, they want to stay here, but there's there's no place for them to go. But I want to hit that from the other side, too, and say that, um, that you know, I grew up here in town. I left to go to college and then couldn't afford to come back. Um, we recently came back here. Um, we've been back for almost six years now. And um, I think for a lot of our friends, they have looked here in Raleigh and have been unable to find inventory in that price point that Dave was just talking about. They're looking at that like high 400, low 500. A lot of the new stuff that has come in is in the 600 or higher range, and they, they can't afford to go there. Um, I have a five-year-old and an eight-year-old, so I kind of fit right in that. Um, you know, the four person, two kids under 18 um, sort of demographic. And, and I, think, I think if we could have that environment where there is affordable senior housing, that shift could totally happen to, to fill those houses with kind of a, the right size. I don't want to say there's a right size house for every person, but, but it's the size that I think is maybe a little bit more appropriate. Um, in between, my husband and I bought our starter house in Tewksbury, and one of the things that we thought was amazing was right down the street from us, they had these little, I'm guessing they were half acre lots, and they had put these little, I'm guessing maybe two bedroom ranches on them, single floor, cute, adorable, beautiful, and that was the population that was in there. We would walk our dog down there, and it was, it was a lot of elderly folks, they had gardens in the backyard. That was where they lived. I have no idea what the price point on it was on it. We never looked at them at that point because okay. it, you know. But but that's the type of thing that I would yeah. love to see here because I think it's very community oriented. It's um, it's a place where people get outdoors and they have friends and they're yeah. social and things like that. And it's it's uh, it's comfy. It's cozy. Yeah. It, it fits Rowley's community mm -hmm. mentality. I mm -hmm. think that's yeah, great. Absolutely. Thank you for We always like hearing best practices, so. <laughs> and, we, and we know the Tinsbury planner, so. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be <laughs> knocking on this door. Yeah. I'm Lori Bethesda. I'm the outreach coordinator for the Council on Aging. Oh, great. And kind of, I think one thing that I end up seeing, and I don't know if it falls into this specifically or not, but seniors who have been living in their own apartments who can't take care of themselves anymore but aren't really looking to be in a nursing home, but they end up there because they want to stay local. Yeah, and yeah. they end up being in a place that is really serving people who have greater needs than they do, and now they've kind of become isolated because they want to be in Raleigh. So I don't know if there's a way to, like some sort of, I've heard, read more a little bit about like shared housing communities for seniors and things like that. So that's like the farther end, like so you've got your smaller house, but now what, what happens after that? Because right. you know, assisted living is, maybe on the very low end, five thousand dollars a month maybe because oh, yeah. people don't really you know it's not covered by insurance unless you have long term care insurance. So um, I think that I personally I see that need and it kind of breaks my heart sometimes when I go and I see and I visit people I'm like, oh you really don't need to be here but you're here because there wasn't another option and that's right. what they chose. Um, so I'll advocate for you. <laughs> that's great. That, I love these testimonials. I mean I hate hearing that it's happening but it's We have a couple of agenda items we got to get to, and I do want to move it along, but I don't want to necessarily cut us off. Uh, I, 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 no, you know, we knew we had 45 minutes of. It's been really important. I know we could probably talk another hour about some of the things mm -hmm. that we're discussing today, uh, and we can certainly hold it over, but I know that we have things that are on the schedule we have to get through. Uh, we're so happy to come back. Terrific. Yeah. Well, we'll, you know, but I don't want to wrap it up. I'm not kicking you out right now, but is there anything you want to do to wrap it up? And yep, Any absolutely. other questions from? I have, I have one quick question. I was looking over here. In, 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 in these programs, are there any, from a contractor standpoint, 
there any incentives for, because material costs have gone above labor costs, for a developer to build these projects with the infrastructure and multiple buildings without doing a lot of them, is there any like kick any type of incentives or state to get back into to build these in Raleigh or anywhere in any town? I don't know of any incentives for contractors. That's, that that was my only point in listening That's to these really two question, and keeping well, that cost down. At right. the same time, we come up in ten minutes. Uh, we just said subsidies for the, uh, the the new type of septic systems, sure. that yeah. and that it, you know you're you're absolutely right. If we're trying to do something a little different, you got to get you got to do something to attract a developer to do something different. Uh, but but right now, there's nothing available for that. Yeah, you know, but that's something that we think we're. For raising these questions, it doesn't mean that we couldn't yeah. try to figure out something. Maybe come from state level, federal level, yeah. somewhere mm -hmm. up above right. local. Right. Well, in your case, there there is some help because in the OSRD, you're able to compact. Yeah. I'm not even saying in mine. Just right. as no, I'm not saying that you're doing that, but you are probably going to save some money if you compact right. down yeah. instead of building five house lots that are scattered all over right. the place. Yeah. yeah. I'm just bringing that up to her you know, yeah. from a state level funding or somehow to alleviate, you know, the cost. How many other uh, communities in the uh, Merrimack Valley or part of your area are uh, don't have city water, city sewer? Uh, oh, there's quite a few. Yeah. Probably okay. yeah, from but Rally, half, there's yes. you know all the smaller ones. Okay. Uh, you know West Newbury. Mm -hmm. Uh, Georgetown doesn't have any sewers. Uh, yeah, a lot of the small. Yeah, I imagine story. that's you know it, it's it's an, an issue for those communities as well when we're talking about trying to find ways to get higher density. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Which is why I think investigating these other options through the developers who've been doing this and looking at the Cape as as, yeah. a, as some options for exploring more unique and innovative solutions is, is the way to do it, or else we're going to keep having to do the same thing we're doing now. <laughs> yeah, well, that's. You know, we get small houses if you can't get a right. full septic system in, if you can't, you know. Uh, so, just as far as wrap up, we, we I did encourage you to continue the conversation on co urbanized because we, like I said, we're, we have a great contingency from Rally on there. Um, and you can access that on your phone. You can you access that. Want to hand these cards around so everyone can yeah. make sure they have okay. one? That's what, that website that they were talking about that you can we need to do some uh, service. Survey data that you can enter, right? Or it's it's a it's like Facebook. Oh, okay. I, gotcha. I'd, I'd say it more like that. Yeah. It's it's more it's it's a fun platform. And, and uh, the website is on yep. our web page. Oh, good. That's right. Down. And yes. don't don't leave without putting a sticker on uh, yes. or several stickers on your favorite type of housing. Yes. And then lastly, we our next regional open house. So uh, when we're looking at more regional strategies and regional issues. It's going to be on um, September 27th in, in April, and that's on our website as well. That was a slide, but unfortunately my computer pooped out. So. <laughs> but we do appreciate you being here. This has been a great conversation, and we do want to continue that. So we encourage uh, to see you either at the next regional event or uh, hopefully we'll be doing the next set of, of conversations with you all. We'll be around goals and strategies, and that'll be in October. One final thought I don't think we can emphasize enough. The plan is yours. It's not, it's not ours telling you what your goals are and strategies are. It's you to tell us what your goals are, what you need. Terrific. Well, thank you for uh, thank you. taking Thanks the time guys. tonight. We appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, just look forward to the next one. All right, so the, uh, the next item we have uh, is uh, our 745 meeting. Uh, I know we're running a little late here, but uh, it's an OSRD, Open Space Residential District, uh, special permit application for 42 Newberry Road, Map 5, Lot 40, Outlying Zoning District. Uh, today we have an update on the status of the revised plans and discussion regarding uh, the conditions of the approval. So uh, I know you're... Uh, Made, made a few adjustments and just going to bring us up to speed, but yeah. we don't have anything well, definitive to look yeah, at. Yeah, no right definitive. Uh, Rich is a little behind with the final plans. Okay. But as we look later, the landscape plans mimics what he's working on. Mm -hmm. But I also, at the last meeting, we had talked about uh, the trails uh -huh. out in behind my house. And so I put that together with Kirk. We've been in touch over the last few weeks. And uh, so this is my property. This will be part of my driveway and then this is the trail that exists. These are all the existing trails. There's a few more I didn't go nuts putting them all in. I got on my mountain bike with my GPS and mapped them. Oh, cool. <laughs> them on the yeah. assessor's map. So this is the trail. It comes out of my property that goes right into Ice Pond. 
mean, everything in the darker colors is, is conservation land that exists. Um, so then once you come back down, you come down in towards Wilson Pond, and I know the Towns and Farm project that is on the assessor's map that obviously doesn't exist yet. What project is that? The Towns and Farm project, it's on the assessor's map, but it's in disarray or something. I know where you know, we've been heard. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, on, it's, all, it's all split up on the assessor's map. Uh -huh. And, uh, you know, they, whatever, however this is approved or however this get on the map, they left an easement to the future road that may or may never exist, which follows down into Wilkes Road and then it ties into Meeting House that's uh -huh. all there, which also connects to another eight acres of conservation so land. You're, you're up there then, no? Yeah, this is us, right. and that goes, okay. like I said, there's an access point there. You know, unfortunately, this, the uh, the Wilson Pond is flooded, so you can't cross that anymore, because uh -huh. the water table's risen there, but you can still follow Meeting House Lane. There's an uh, access point on Wilkes Road, on the side of Wilkes Road, and then this comes down into this other eight-acre parcel. Is the, the trail from, from your lot to Ice Pond, is that actually walkable? I mean, is yes, oh yeah, it's, yeah. it's a little overgrown yeah. in a few spots from, they must have done some work in there. Because my other trail comes across this property, but this one exists also. Right. Um, it's a little overgrown, there's quite a few trees down. Okay. Um, but that, it's all there. And that's all Rowley Conservation? Yep, yep, right down through here. That's the 28, 20 acres of Ice Pond, 12 acres, it's called Ellsworth Road Conservation. Yeah. And it falls right down in the Towns and Farm project and right to Wilkes Road. So, uh, what you're really demonstrating here though is that it's part of the open space residential development. We do have a, a, a passive use component for yes. an access to these yeah. different trail systems. Yeah. And, that, and you did, I think you did at the last meeting indicate you'd be willing to provide public access. Yeah, and that. when we look at the landscape plan, we, we've got a, a you know, somewhat of a trail right. in early stages. We haven't quite got there with our riches plan to really nail yeah. it down. But it's we put it on the plan just so you can see. And I forget what we talked about. And, you know, we're certainly so looking to overburden this with a, yeah. with a activity or a use to it. But is it going to be any place that's going to be uh, public park and we can say enjoy this public trail? It, or it, we could put up a sign that uh, asks for. Public parking, it's a private road, there's two different sure. elements there. Uh -huh. I mean, I, I think if we can develop something, at least I would like to see something just at least marks that it's public access. Yeah. So even if they park out on Newbury Road, which I know isn't great. Yeah, but, or if they're just residents in the neighborhood. Right, right, yeah. so they don't feel uh, like they're trespassing if they access. Yeah, them. all the trails out there are readily used. I mean, mm -hmm. they're all traveled a lot. And even the section here that comes out on the Tenney Road, which is somebody's property. You know, it's heavily used, you know, so you know, it's not like you're weeding through brush. You know, it's very wide open. No machetes out there? No. Mm -hmm. It's very used. So, so that's, I just want to present that was one of your... Oh, you did your homework. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah I learned a lot. Did, did GPS you? drop that all on the map for you? No, I'm not, oh, that, okay. I'm not that good yeah. with the computer yet. You know, so, so the big thing, too, is, you know, there's about 40 acres of conservation land behind my house in this undeveloped project is also about 40 acres and if it ever does get mm -hmm. developed you know we'll lose about half of our green space that's back there if whatever is there unless they do an OSRD. Right. what's that unless they do the same thing that's, that's right which we'll we'll is our own trail system which they probably will yeah, yeah. so all right so now we'll get into the landscape part of it and i blew it up and add it to 20 scale because 40 being the project as size it is, it would just be little dots of plants and everything else. So I raised it up a little bit. And one of our bigger concerns through this was about the driveway. And so we've added, you know, like we've talked about brick pavers. We've changed the driveway a little bit, but everything we've slightly changed, we've added with brick pavers. So you can definitively see the 20 foot wide road, no wider stays 20 feet and then we add the pavers to it and then it narrows down to more of a driveway setting okay. in front of our house and in the new house across the way. So, yeah. I mean, we have to have Larry look at it. Uh, and when, well, we, when the architect comes in, we'll see 
the buildings and see yeah. localized landscaping and yeah. the yeah. foundation planting. Like I said, you know, I just wanted to come and present Maybe something. Maybe a little more planting around the little barn thing. Yeah, where yeah. where that's kind of like you know, that's in a questionable architect phase. So anyway, uh, that's good progress, though. Right? So that's what and then do. this is kind of we we've kind of lined um, the tr the trail with trees, so as they grow and mature, it'll really create a nice. You know, path. Sure, see that contour around there. Yeah. Yeah. So it'll run right up the hill. Want an orchard, John? Yeah. Well, we, I thought about it, but it's a lot of maintenance. Oh, okay. Yeah. The uh, homeowners may not like the maintenance fees of apple trees. Yeah. So, otherwise, I'd, I'd be Put doing all the maintenance. Close. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, so basically, this is where we're at. And this is pretty much a, a rendering of what Rich is doing, okay. almost exact, because most of the stuff me and Michelle, we laid over the plan he's working on. Uh -huh. You know, other than had to line up a few different things, but this is basically what you're going to see from Rich. Other than you know, because he hasn't done the ponds yet, and what we're going to plant in the ponds or around the ponds. So, but as of that, this is basically what we're looking at. Made a lot of progress. Absolutely. Yeah. And I'm sure Rich knows, and Kirk talked about it. They always want a uh, an index of what plants are going. Yeah, we have that. Oh, you got oh, gotcha. it. Full. So, so this is where we're at, and this also will include the alternate changes with the front house, with adding the garage and removing one room, and adding a new patio and stuff to really bring it all together. Yeah. So, Perfect. And uh, when do you think Rich will have a plan ready for? Hopefully within two weeks. Okay. Because we're uh, we're next meeting is next August. meeting we're. Uh, yeah. Depending on what Larry says, we can yeah. potentially, you know, if you get it to him in two weeks, we'll probably have enough time to review it, get comments back to you, so yeah. you can I'm hoping he, he'll come be in like here a week. and maybe look for something. Hoping he's a week final. away. We'll, we'll, he said that a couple weeks ago, so. Yeah. How's the architect doing, too? He's doing well. He's yeah. away. So that's why he's not here either. So, like I said, I just wanted to come in and we're hoping to get that full package to you guys in, in another week or so. All right. Well, uh, thanks for taking the time to. He moves up to speed on it, but it looks I good. hate missing these meetings. Yeah, I want to keep moving. Keep moving. No, no, I mean, that's good. Well, that's what I'm saying. If we, if Larry gets the chance to review it, yeah. and you can comment back and maybe make whatever final adjustments yeah. he wants, we can be closer to yeah. closing the meeting. Because I mean, pretty much he's had it done uh, except most of the drainage stuff. So, and we did, we uh, perk tested the third, the, the missing system, a month ago. So that system's going to go up in that corner with the other. So mm -hmm. we're, uh, we're right there. Over there. The drainage stuff. So you even sound happier. Yeah, yeah. We're getting, we're feeling better every <laughs> meeting that goes by. So this is remind me though. So you're going to do it as condominiums, condominiums, right? Yes. Well, okay. So it's a five-unit yeah. condominium project yep. with yep. a shared septic system. Yep. And you'll have no. exclusive no. use lines. What's that? Each has shared septic. System. Oh no! Each all each building yeah. will have a septic. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, but there's two. There's two units. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Because ours right now is there, this one's in the front, and then our new unit, and these two are all back there. Okay. So, yep. Is each unit responsible for its own system? So yes. yes. So, so if there's a failure, then that unit has to deal yep. with it? Yep. And they can define the yard space to include the unit. What's that? Include the backyard or whatever with the unit. That's your Oh, yeah. Your yard. Septic with an with exclusive septic. use area. Yep. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 And the future idea is, because it is almost five full acres of grass minus the buildings now, we're going to kind of give slight excuse, exclusive use areas behind the maintenance line. So if they want to put a little shed or have a little garden or something that they can, that's not in the homeowner's <coughs> mowing landscape maintenance type package. So you can get pretty creative with it, massive yeah. with what you can assign to each unit, what their rights and. Yeah, so, yeah. so we have four dogs, which yeah. will be hidden way over here, away from everybody. Well, you know. At least you won't have to worry about uh, whether yeah. the master deed allows it. Yeah. You'll make sure it does. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's your writing. Right? That's right. Yeah. That's that right. shouldn't be a yeah. problem. Yeah. All right. All right. So so thank you very much. Thank you for coming in. All right. Thanks, guys. We'll look forward to seeing what we'll comes next. Okay. So our next item, um, we're going to uh, we have a special permit application for the outdoor external illumination of a wall-mounted sign for uh, George Seropoulos of the MCR Technologies for property located at 285 Newburyport Turnpike. 
Uh, assessor's map 16, lot 4, located in the retail RE zoning district. Uh, so we're reviewing a certificate of vote uh, pertaining to the special permit approval, which uh, I believe we closed the meeting last time. Mm -hmm. We did I take a vote with a couple of uh, conditions. Looks like uh, you taken those conditions and Yeah, it's actually it just uh, they were uh, pretty standard. Right. This, this was Given that we've already worked on the special permit and site plan approval for the, yeah. the project, this was sort of uh, just trailing administrative matter. He just wants to sign. And uh, yeah, I, and I guess the um, I guess the date on it, if because the vote was actually taken on um, there was a vote taken at the last meeting mm -hmm. to approve. So the, the date on this, I need to, to change that to the uh, previous date. Yeah. Oh, okay. It was on the on the on the June date, the members voted. Yeah. And it was five in favor, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, you get two spellings for spherosopolis. You took two pronunciations, so. Yeah, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> but no, there's two different spellings. So in the in the yeah. ray line, it's S P H, and then. No, yeah, it's the top one, and it's right. Well, all right. So you need to change the, the second one. Yeah. I'll make sure that changes that. That's why I need you guys to see. Thing. Thing. But otherwise, uh, it's the people from uh, MCR take a look at this, right? Right, yeah. Yes, the top. Right. So, so uh, and they've otherwise looked at this, they have no questions and yeah. feel like there's yeah. conditions yeah. they can. Uh, yeah, it's all like, these are pretty standard. Sure. Um, it's kind of so, yeah, it's kind of we, do we need to approve the certificate of vote? No, actually, this is uh, just really to have everybody see it. Okay. And because uh, I didn't have it, I mean, we we did the vote last time, so but I just wanted, but I didn't have this produced, so I drew this up and I was just presenting. Now we can, everybody's okay with it. I mean, I can. Yes, uh, and I'll stick around today if you want to do it today, or I can do it in the morning if you're yeah. around tomorrow morning. Um, but I, I should. I, I can. Or you can, can keep it all. You you make make sure sure you tell you what, guys. Name. Yeah. yeah. Give me, I'll, I'll make the change. Give me the page two. I can sign them. Oh. Can I just sign the page two? And you have one that's not scanned? Yeah, but I, I mean, I can. Uh, I'll, I can print it down. Okay, good. All right. So then I think we're everyone is comfortable with the uh, certificate of vote in terms that we've provided the conditions. I trust, I trust Cliff. <laughs> good. That's good. I think we're going to move okay, forward on that. Good. All right. So our next item. Uh, this night was on for 7:55. Uh, hope everyone's still around. We, we have a, a site plan review for. Uh, pardon me. It's a continued public hearing for a site plan review for proposed building for Hydrant Regency Dog Kennel operation at 104 Newbury yeah. Turnpike, Map 14, Lot 14-2, in the retail RE zoning district. So we're uh, and I believe we have the applicant here today to give us a, uh, an update on the status of some revised plans. Am I right? I, I think yeah, Mr. Bernhard, he, I, I just asked him in case, like, just to be here to, to represent. Sure. So uh, but in general, um, I can just explain. They, they actually did submit, and you actually have it in your packet there. That's the revised plan. It's gone to Larry, but there wasn't enough time for Larry mm -hmm. to actually review it. Larry's reviewing at this point, and we should be able to um, have comments and by the August 9th. You actually moved the uh, telephone pole out of the <coughs> Yeah, they, they said, yeah, so I think at the, like, the last. So that was moved back, right? Yeah, yeah. that was, yeah. That's good. So uh, it sounds like you, well, since the last time you were here, we had a little delay, and then uh, but things are starting to move along again. Kurt actually really helped me out in this situation because the site plan should have been submitted on time. And I made contact with the gentleman that you had volunteered to give him a call, so. Um, yeah, we worked all that. Yes, uh, we did. Rich William. Yeah, uh, so. Like, Good, and, and it was, it was a, you know, covering to see the plans moving forward, because if there's no activity, there's nothing we can do with it, okay? So at least we have something to take a look at, uh, although I know we're not, we're gonna continue again tonight. Uh, all the issues that existed the last time, I mean, are still out there regarding that, that uh, trailer. And, and we can't do anything about that at this point. So you're aware that, that it, you're, whatever's out there now is sort of at your own peril, uh, as we can't uh, permit it. I thought it was going to be going before the Board of Selectmen for approval. Not by the direction of this 
board, so well, I don't know. At some point, you need a, a, I think you need a kennel license from the board of selectmen, uh, but that's a separate thing. I have a kennel license. Oh. Um, well, and this is, is where we This is where we were. I think, we, I think you need our, you need a site plan approval, and then once you have a site plan approval, you can ask the board of selectmen to approve your temporary that's structure. You need, sorry, you need board of selectmen approval for the temporary structure. Yes. Right. But that's separate from this procedure. Okay. I thought we needed to get the approval first on the site plan before we were referred over to the you do. board they of selectmen. That's generally the way things are supposed to work. Exactly. So we're just waiting for the approval to happen. Except that, uh, uh, you know, not to over ground we've already covered. The building shouldn't be there until you have the Board of Selectmen approval. So the fact that it's operating today is not in compliance with any any authority of the building inspector or, the, or this board or the Board of Selectmen. To, well, that's why I say you're doing that at your own peril. The fact that we're now have plans to look at is kind of keeping us moving along this process, but it, you know, uh, just keep moving is what I guess all we can say. And we'll, 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 I want to go. I yeah. want to get this done. You know, right. I'm not trying to delay anything no, at no. all whatsoever, okay? So, you know, let's just make well, that Well, we need Larry's input on this yeah. before we get back. Right, right. right. Can't do it. Right. Right. time. But so, but with that being said, uh, Larry does have the plans. I'm sure he'll review them within the next two weeks, hopefully get them back to your engineer. And we are going to, we'll put you on the, would you like to continue the meeting until the next public August. hearing uh, in, in August? August. What I understand, yes, yeah. in the yeah. email. Yes. Okay, so that's what we'll take a vote on now. What's that uh, meeting? August 9th. Okay. August 9th. Yeah. Okay. So uh, we, we have a motion to continue the uh, public hearing until August 9th. Make it a second. second. Uh, all in favor? Uh, great. Okay, thanks. And this is where we're at. So thanks for coming in, though. All right. Have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Chris, you know, I don't think Mr. Penny and the public hearing for the OSR David. Oh, I apologize, and I, well, I think we can. It's safe to do that. Uh, a, a motion to, to just make a motion. Take, I think it's, I've already told them that it was August, August 9th at, at uh, 7.30. So Second. Good. good. So we're, uh, motion's on the floor to continue the public hearing from 42 Newberry to August 9th. And I think we have first, uh, we have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 So we'll continue that as well. Uh, the, uh, the last item for our 750 hearing is a site plan review for the proposed Briar Barn Inn located at 101 Main Street, formerly the Country Garden Inn Motel, map 25, lot 92, Central Zoning District, uh, request for continuance. So our applicant has uh, is still working with their engineers and they've been in touch with our consulting engineer and yeah. they just asked that uh, they have... They needed more time. Right, but uh, as well. they're still... Uh, so they submitted a letter for... You know what they're doing? Oh, what do you mean? What are they doing? You know what they're doing? Yeah, I mean John. I mean John Morton is working on the on the site plan. The revision of the. But I, I mean I haven't seen any any of the revisions yet. Nothing's been presented to us yet. They just needed. I mean it was taking longer than than I think than they intended. I think the comments we had made them really go back to the drawing board. Yeah. They uh, still need to go to historic. Yeah, they, have they actually started the process? They haven't started the process. No, we were hoping to see something tonight. So, okay. um, but just as a, if you see them before we do, just as a reminder, they're not complete with us yet. Oh, because absolutely. And okay. even if we're a little bit of ways away before we even consider a vote, but we do. We'll certainly condition it upon yeah, speaking with uh, you know your board and getting of whatever course. approvals. The they only need. thing they have is a demolition permit for something, right? Yeah, they have demolition permit for all yeah, of the structures. So for the non-historic structures uh, in the back. Okay. Well, I've been corresponding with uh, Ms. McGee. Okay. Yeah, I'll, as, I'll long as, as long as they know, I, I just got a feeling they thought we, they were kind of done with us. Okay. But we have a design review to go over on the um, architectural details on the addition that they're putting on the historic house, the gallery, and um, with your input, ours we'd like to kind of get an idea of the architectural feel of the entire site even though currently it's um, beyond the mysterious 200 foot line there is no 200 foot line <laughs> the urban legend but whatever it's oh i'd love to that's not quite as uh, concrete as a bright it's line not, as it's supposed a, to be it's a, it's a it's a very gray line let's put it that way it's an issue that we'll we'll be working it's on with this soon oh is that um, okay but you know we'd, we'd really like to 
this is such a wonderful project, and we're very excited about it. We want to make sure that we get the best well, I, possible. It seems like the developer would certainly want to work closely with you on this one, yeah, because that's absolutely. as much as want to see what they bring to us. He did say he has uh, an interest in preserving the architectural, uh, uh, historical aspects of the ar architecture. So, we'll that's the case. so plus, we have this guy who's an architect, so you know. Uh, and right. <laughs> and I understand he knows some people that know a thing or two about it as well. <laughs> uh, so, just need a motion to continue this hearing. To uh, second. second. August 9th. So, we have a, a motion and a second. To all in favor of continuing the public hearing until August 9th? Aye. Aye. Was that Troy or was that? I think it was Cliff with the motion. Uh, David was the second. Allowed second. I'd like to give it to uh, Troy. We can get him in the record. Yeah, that'd be nice. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, uh, at this point, I think we've, we're done with all the agenda items. We do have a couple of things we want to try to work through. And uh, Kirk brought to my attention that we've got planning board meetings from 2016, which I suppose uh, would be uh, remiss if we didn't close them out. There's actually four sets of minutes there, and I, um, I sit two out, but the next two are actually relative, I mean, one is actually only a page and a quarter, and um, it, it, if, you, if you want to wait till the next time, or if you want to just take a break a little bit, I, I kind of felt like this tonight would be, yeah, since we have the MVBC, we could use this tonight, otherwise to do some of this administrative stuff, and then we also have the ZRC appointments that we need to okay. take care of as well. Well, I mean, well, I read two of them, but I wouldn't mind make, I'll make a motion to approve the uh, November 9th and October 12th. And I read those two. The other one wasn't there. Oh, okay. Those are the two oldest ones. Yeah. 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 So, so I'll, I'll second that motion. Okay, so we have motion for to approve the October 12th and November 9th uh, draft minutes of the planning board meeting. So, uh, all in favor? Aye. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Uh, so, I think that's, uh, that's another uh, five to nothing. Good. Give us a few minutes to look at December 21st. Yeah, go ahead. And then you know what? If that's okay, then we'll put 15th on hold so we can deal with 2017 next time around. Okay. All right. That was a sketchy meeting. That was the one. That's the one where there technically wasn't a real form. So yeah, there was a little bit of discussion. That's the one I missed. Yeah. But, yeah. but I think we did the only thing we could do, which was to, to adjourn, continue and adjourn, so right? That one was there. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I had called you, and you said there was nothing much on the agenda anyway, so. Oh, you didn't know. I was not sure. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know you were well, well, that was We easy. always have fun. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, that's silly. I'll, I'll move that we approve the uh, December 12th meeting, uh, and, minutes of the meeting. And I'll have to second because I'm the only other person who's here. Who's here. <laughs> okay, so uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 All right, so uh, we've closed out 2016, which I think uh, on save that the, we should... Uh, save the next one to this time. That's right. Now we also have... Uh, ZRC. ZRC. I will volunteer to stay on. I'll volunteer to stay on. Good. Uh, so we make a motion. Just so, but you know what, I mean, just because Troy's here and new to it, the ZRC is the Zoning Review Committee. Uh, the board, the, the town, asks a member from a couple of different boards to participate in the ZRC. Uh, Selectman, uh, Zoning Board of Appeals, Planning Board, and the Building Inspector. And uh, so we've always had, for the last few years, these two gentlemen have done it, uh, and, and it's worked out well. But we've had a couple that we reviewed uh, during the year as, as the amendments come up, and, and it's good to have people that bring it back to us to discuss it before it goes on the town ballot. So, uh, Do the planning board officially writes the right. change in the zone? <coughs> yeah. 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 We did look for the ZRC. The ZRC wants to go ahead with some proposal. We still have to come up with a way more. We have to help with the public hearing about it. That's right. And I guess I mean, it's a time meeting. Yeah. Right. And, and there, is, right there is work upcoming to be done because um, it, the first of the, the retail marijuana thing, I think we're going to want to tackle that. Right. Wasn't there some, and signs? Signs. signs. And if Dan Peterson signs. were here, he would. Uh, if, if, I mean, we're actually. He, he wants me to look for samples uh, from other towns, which I have some. Dispens for dispensary or signs? Uh, for signs. Who said that? 
I'm sorry. Oh, I was talking to Dave Peterson. Oh, he asked you to do that? Yeah, yeah. We were just talking about like the sign, uh, you know, the issues with the signs here. But that's that's right. So, you know, just so we can stay on track, you want to just go ahead and do the, uh, 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 an appointment or motion to allow uh, Cliff Pierce and Dave Jakewith to uh, be appointed to the uh, ZRC for this next fiscal year. Are you a planning board appointee? Yes, uh, Bob Mary is a selectman. Oh, yeah, that's right. So, can uh, I get a second more of the two of you? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. So, what I want to, so the issues that are coming up for the ZRC, are again the, the, the recreational marijuana, uh, but wasn't there something we were talking about? Well, remember we actually had talked just briefly about that this whole thing with retail marijuana is going to be coming up and it will take effect, the law will be taking effect in, 20, uh, in July 2018. Uh, so, um, so we probably would, I think we had discussed last time about generally looking at the, the dispensary bylaw and really mirroring that bylaw to create a retail marijuana bylaw. Um, so, I mean, I think that would be where we start with the ZRC is to, is to consider that. I think, I, I think we already limited to the retail zone, right? right? Yeah, retail. Right. So just the, the, the only put the two types of uses. Treat them both the same. Yeah, kind of like an yeah. overlay for um, yeah. a lot of towns. Like, there was an article in the Globe uh, a couple of days ago. Yeah. Where that. A lot of towns are just going to ban it outright. Well, it's not. Yeah, they just yeah. actually gave. Uh, the, 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 does the, uh, the the board of selectmen now have the authority to make well, decisions? Well, yeah, the, the, the legislature is talking with the Senate or the House. Uh, uh, wants to change it to allow the board of selectmen. Right. Which is a very strange proposal, in my, my opinion, because it's a use. And, it should, it should go to town meeting. It should be treated as a zoning bylaw. You know, but, uh, that's what they're talking about. Who knows what the final uh, bill was? Made. Right. It's kind of well, if we increase, well. if we increase the distance to mirror the state distance, yeah, maybe. Yeah. Pretty well limits. You know, I, when they were doing the um, the zoning bylaw, they There, I've noticed. You don't think that's related to that facility, or no? I think it's it's related to. That's a tough one. So that's not that yeah. yeah, I can't. Yeah, my mailbox cleaned up many times. Very good. Yeah. So. Um. um but it, it's, it's. I'm not sure. Is that use is fully up and running? No, too. That's the other thing. It's kind of hard to know. I don't know if it's being used. To, I'm sure they're cultivating in there, but I don't know if anybody. If it's. I, mean, I know it's open for. RMD purposes, but I don't know uh, if they're getting the volume that they expected. They probably are. It's just, um, you know, if there has to be a prescription, yeah. it's probably, I mean, I've seen some cars coming in the back, but it's not like the traffic that I expected. Well, uh, and it's all those things that the ZRC's got to consider, and, and we don't, you know, I think, you know, that's not something that we're going to need to kick around to. But for some reason, I thought there was one other pressing issue that wasn't really related to something like that. Uh, oh, um, the, uh, for the zoning group. But, oh, well, the, there's the signs. Maybe there's, it was just the signs. Um, I didn't sign. yeah. Well, we did address it, but now it's oh, what is the sign by law. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, the sign by law, you know, where your parent is. Well, then we'll get to the deal as we come up. That's a tough one. That's not for the fall. That's for the next Friday. Yeah. Yeah. But we should say, Jack, when Dave Peterson brought it up, I think there's signs. I'm sorry, who brought it up? Dave. Uh, David, just he if, there, if there's a consensus among the boards in town that, that we should do this, I think we should do it. But uh, you know, up until recently, it has not been a consensus. That was my opinion. You know, just something you don't want to go to town meeting. Some people are. I don't think we pass it. Well, but I agree with Cliff. Maybe in the last one, they were talking about the Signs. Oh, yeah, they're pretty, pretty uh, they're a, yeah. of Railroad Avenue, 
there are six of them in there right now. In Boston American Barbecue? That, 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 well, American that, that, Barbecue is one of them, and then two Conley ones, some exciting guys one, and something else there. And I don't mind, the thing we have to write carefully would be the political signs. So yeah. Six weeks before the election and down the next day. Uh, yeah, I don't know. That's a tough some issue. rules on that, aren't there? Well, political science is a, t a tough issue, right? You know, yeah. I think you should. Uh, first, I think we should stay away from them and just allow them. Uh -huh. yeah. But that doesn't mean you can put one up anywhere in town. You know, it can't be on the town. It's in the town's right away, for example. Well, well then I would have spread it out. Well, that's that's not. I got two guys and put my planning board sign up for the simulation. Now I don't put up signs. <laughs> <laughs> It could be the difference next voted. election. You never know. You didn't even have been appointed, Mike. Right? <laughs> <laughs> well, I got more votes than most of the selectmen. <laughs> got the signs in his closet. Did you something with them? Did you put architect under your name? <laughs> no. <laughs> so, uh, what That's else? The funny thing you mentioned it. I took all the planning board signs and took them to the sign. First, did it at the bottom part converted to architect. <laughs> Oh, no, but uh, oh, no, I no, no, that was, uh, no, that was, um, we just did the, uh, time. Do you have any invoices? Not yet, no. Okay. All right, good. Why is it on yet? Oh, well, well that's there. always on. That's just <laughs> if we have them. Uh, okay. Today. Any updates? Uh, no. Well, the other thing is that uh, I'm going to a thing first thing in the morning about an updated performance appraisal form that, um, that will be that the town is adopting and to evaluate your your performance here at the uh, planning yeah, board. Exactly. Just for, just for <laughs> <her. laughs> We're needing a new matrix to figure out how to do that. <laughs> so, yeah, but um, um, I mean, so I, I'll get this the first thing in the morning. So there's a new form. They're going to talk about it. So I'll let you know. Okay. Yeah. But we just did a review for you not too long ago, right? And because you're the only place, the only reason we we, we we need to deal with it. Didn't we do your Did you do it? I don't think we did it. You might have done it. Maybe it was, maybe it was a year ago then. I thought maybe, maybe, maybe really, well, I didn't even, I didn't realize we haven't done meet, meet, uh, minutes since 2016. So. <laughs> the thing the takeaway is that there's a new form. So okay. It's a, a um, so it's a you know, a new form that and I think it's actually now a requirement to to do the Good. Motion to adjourn? Motion to adjourn. All in favor? Great. Okay.